Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another live stream from uh, myself, Pharaoh. And we've got um, some fantastic guests on tonight talking about a really interesting uh, topic, um, tradition and the destruction of the canon. So let, let me just welcome Alexander Adams. Uh, say hello. Hi, um, I'm getting a bit of, I'm getting a bit of, oh, hang on, I know why. Okay. Hi. <laughs> hi. Sorry. Yes. Uh, oh, sorry. I was, I was getting some echo. Um, yeah. Hi. Uh, good to be back. Um, I had fun last time, and uh, I think this is going to be uh, a very productive discussion. Great. And we got uh, the um, the great Panama hat. Uh, oh, is it? Is it? Is it? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> is it the great now? Oh, I, I, I don't know. I, I was just desperate for some kind of descriptor, <laughs> and that, that's literally what came to mind first. So, uh... right though. Well, uh, I, I, I wouldn't quite go that far, but uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> um, yes, uh, I believe I was here before uh, to rant about the uh, uh, iconoclasm and rioting that we witnessed a few months back in that those dark, dark times. Um, so, uh, yes, hello, hello again, everybody. Great, and we've got a newcomer to the show, uh, Phoebus. Do you want to say hello to everyone? Good evening. Um, yeah, the first time streaming. So. Yeah, excellent. Okay, cool. So let, let's just jump straight into it. So uh, we're talking about the ideas of tradition and the canon, and I, and I thought, you know, this is particularly timely, obviously with the iconoclasm um, and all the destruction around statues <clears throat> recently. Um, the whole kind of focus and emphasis on this is about um, kind of taking down uh, elements of the past that kind of don't fit with certain aspects of uh, today's society. And so I thought we'd kind of step back a second from I, purely iconoclasm to tradition and the canon as a, as a whole. And of, obviously, over the last, um, you know, 30 to 40 years, there's been efforts to try and destabilize um, traditional thoughts of the arts in general, and also the the idea of the canon. So that is, we'll, we'll talk about definitions more in a second. But the idea of a group or a collection um, of acknowledged great works that are handed down um, has been challenged recently. And I thought now would be a great time to uh, yeah chat about uh, chat about that. So so let's go to definitions first. Um, guys, do you want to go around and um, talk talk through, you know, how would you fi define kind of tradition, traditional arts and the canon? Maybe Panama, do you want to kick us off? Um, yes. All right, then. Um, well, in terms of definition, um, it's a bit tricky because um, really traditional arts are anything that have survived a kind of longish period of time um but of course that period of time you you can't set an exact number for how long something has to be around before it becomes a tradition if you see what i mean um so i don't really have a concrete definition for you um i was unable to really come up with one because of course um things things going all the way back to the kind of uh pre-norman era part of our canon but then so are things that were written in the 19th 50s say or you know in the 1910s so um really it's anything that's endured long enough to become revered and usually just the fact that it has endured so long is um kind of proof that it has a lasting uh impact in some way you know for better or for worse i think so that that would be my answer and i'm sorry i couldn't give you a concrete uh, kind of, this is this is the definition but i don't think it's really possible that's, that, yeah, I think I think it's interesting. It's something that we often talk about tra tradition, especially um, in kind of more conservative circles. And uh, but, but I think it's something hard to pin down. Um, Alexander, do you want to come in and give your thoughts? Yeah, uh, I think uh, um, I think we should think of the canon in two different ways. First of all, it's a framework, and then secondly, it's the contents of that framework. So I would say a canon generally is a mnemonic or narrative device which organizes the greatest, the most revered and most influential art or production in any particular field. Um, generally, I mean, it would generally go back as far as you, you would want to. So I think the Western art canon would go back to the 
the ancient Greeks or the Cyclades or possibly even Mesopotamia or ancient Egypt. But anyway, so it's so the framework um, is remains, and it's uh, the contents, however, change because they are constantly added to, revised. They are winnowed, so you lose some of the some of the dead weight. Um, constantly, everyone is proposing a new uh, a new set of heroes for their canon, and this is weeded out. So this is uh, it's not imposed it's an aggregate thing so what happens is you get lots of writers lots of art critics lots of scholars lots of artists lots of art lovers art collectors they all contribute they say these are the these are the heroes these are the most important points that you have to learn in order to understand the tradition and to pass it on um, but it's not imposed it's never controlled it's always changing so every every book, every um, art history that's proposed includes the staple names, and then maybe it has a few new names. And obviously, we'll talk about ways uh, people want to see the canon change, but it's not something that can be imposed. Uh, and I think that that's something that's uh, is going to come up when we talk about like Marxism and feminism and um, expanding it to non the non West. Um, but I would say the contents are constantly changing. Well, they, no, they're, they're, being, they're being mildly revised over uh, a long period of time by uh, a group of both experts and also art lovers, people who are interested and want to contribute. Yeah, I, I think there's some really interesting ideas to unpack there. So, you know, I think the, the organic growth. Um, but, but before I talk a little bit more, maybe um, Phoebus, I don't think you've got anything else to add on the tr tradition versus canon. Um. Well, so in my field of uh, commercial art or graphic design, um, I can't, I don't think there's much of a canon really, um, not as there is in the sort of high arts, the liberal arts. Um, but in terms of tradition, that's something that's very apparent. So it's uh, sort of very craft based, I suppose. And there are certain um, conventions and skills that have been passed down. Um, so, yeah, on the tradition side, I think it's quite easy, but um, I can't say there's much of a canon or yeah, an identifiable I, I, canon. I, I think what's interesting is that uh, obviously the canon is part of tradition, but there's a whole load of other stuff. So maybe we could say that tradition is something that is, is passed down. It's um, something that's, uh, you know, old. I, I guess you've got traditions are formed by living people, but they're kind of... Um, you know, it's a tradition once it's kind of, once I think there's a, once someone's dead. Um, and I think, and the canon is all about the best stuff as well, isn't it? So it's, it's the kind of stuff chosen to be, to be the best. And it's clustered together around a, would you say like a group identity? Like, obviously we talk about the Western canon or the English canon or, you know, the, the English school, for example. Um, I, I, I would say it has to be to some degree. You can talk about a world canon, but it becomes very, very diffuse. And it's very. And the whole point about canon is that it's supposed to be a mnemonic. It's a narrative. How do you feed in, you know, the sort of the fetish sculpture of West Africa into the tradition of pottery in Mesoamerica? Uh, you can't really. It only works when it's actually some sort of. Uh, it's a connected narrative and also it's a mnemonic so you're not going to be able to remember all of these different tribes in africa all of the sort of the you know, the amazonian tribes and the inuit and so forth so you have to limit it i think the, the the thing is that we'll talk about later the expansion of the canon but my contention is that the expanded can canon is the destroyed canon because it no longer functions as either a narrative or a mnemonic yeah, I think that idea of the narrative is really interesting because, again, I think we think of it as, you know, it's it's a kind of a definite list. But again, I like the idea of it's a kind of a story we tell each other um, about how we've got to uh, how we've created some of the some of the best um, art that's out there. So uh, I think I think that gives us some really interesting kind of broad introductions um, in terms of the next. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but if I could just add to what uh, Alex said. Um... Yeah. I think that um, 
what's important with the group I, I identity um, of a uh, canon or a tradition is that it's kind of organic, that um, it can't be something that was just constructed by an academic, say. So, for example, um, the idea of, uh, say, when a Marxist says uh, workers' art or a workers' literary canon, it, it doesn't exist because it's a construct of, of a particular academic of a, and, a, and of a particular viewpoint you know um there wasn't just one critic that decided somewhere in the 1600s that um shakespeare was now going to be the kind of national author of britain he just he his works just sort of endured for a, a multitude of reasons um so yeah i i agree with what alex was saying and i'd just like to add that essentially that um the the works of art have importance for you know west african um sculptors um have only a limited importance for as he said i think it was um the meso-americans for example you know it, it has to be organic and part of the locale yeah that that's, that's, that's some great points there like i think there's again that interesting point around who chooses um the canon and i think you were like uh, you were making a point uh, alex in your um, initial summary of what it is around the non-professionality or some of those decision makers and i thought that was quite quite interesting because again i think we think because i think we're, we're kind of stuck in this kind of university world where the you know the expert chooses what's good for us yeah um, I, and that's not what the past was like yeah I, I think also because the academic now is a big subject for um sorry the canon is a big subject for academics now that you tend to find that academics are, are talking about other academics or they're taking or they're tilting at particular authors or particular professors who they've got a con they've got some sort of case against um but it's i think if you if you just go back and you look at the very old um art history so i mean the, the first of the modern art histories was Vasari and he talks about um oh you know that particular paintings by particular artists were were, were treasured by art collectors uh and discussed amongst artists so it's so he's not talking here about um authority figures he's talking here about uh fellow uh, so these are colleagues these are collectors um and the, these are so these are things that are shared amongst the the, the body of um art con, art producers and art consumers it's only later that the the idea of um academic uh, art history comes in in the 19th century or so so i think that the canon is something that has existed long before uh well i mean it, I, I mean you could go back to ancient greece so it existed it existed back then as well yeah, with Vasari, I think what's interesting because he he created the book for the Medici's, didn't he? I think he was commissioned to kind of get, give like a, a landscape yeah. of all of all yeah. of the uh, Florentines. But uh, I think that maybe brings up one of the interesting points around um, you know bias. Now, now I'm going to try and give you some give you some e evil questions here. Um, you know, obviously Vasari is a Florentine. If you if you read um, lives, it's super biased to uh the florentine artist basically, <laughs> yes. basically. And, and i guess that goes on to my uh first question you know like obviously the canon to have a canon you need to have um kind of objective truth and beauty so so if we're saying something is good we need to define it within a range of uh good and bad um how how can we how can anyone really understand um, objective truth, I guess, is, is, is a question that someone might might, um, might say. You know, um, what if it, aren't these people just all kind of guessing, or they've just been told by uh, other people what's good? Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts on that. Uh, well, first of all, you're, you're completely right. That's a, that's a horrible question. Uh, secondly, um, objective objective measures are very very tricky. Um, I'm not sure that I could maintain and that there is an objective standard. There may be measuring sticks that you might want to use. I mean, canon should explain this comes from the Greek, which means measuring stick or, or ruler. So it's basically something that you compare art to. Um, so an artist would work, would compare himself to the standard of the great art that had come before. 
Uh, I think that is perhaps the only me way of measuring the greatness of the art, aside from what, how, what was expected of the art by the commissioner, by the producer, and by the viewers of the time. Uh, and you have to see if it meets these criteria. Is it satisfying in itself? Is it beautiful? Is it well made? Is it meaningful? As in, you know, does it tell a story? Because so much of art, um, be it religious or history painting or genre painting, had some sort of message to tell. So if it could tell that message clearly, that was some sort of objective measure. Um, you could talk about, well, I then, I would, I would, steer clear of realism because realism is a bit of a sticky wicket so anyway those are my um, initial thoughts Pamela did I see you unmute were you going to have uh, some thoughts um, well I'd like to reiterate that that is an absolutely horrible question um, <laughs> when you start kind of casting uh, aspersions of objective truth onto traditions and canons because very often um, many of the uh, tradition tra traditional uh, uh, artworks and pieces of literature and music we inherit were made um, at moments where uh, I may be wrong, but I don't think that you would really have people thinking in such a way, or at least not in a way that would um, influence uh, the art itself, you know, kind of thinking, well, it's because I think it's a very modern and specifically more postmodern style of thought is to say kind of, uh, you know, what, what, what is the, how, how can we measure something? How is something objectively good? Um, but my answer is um, quite cynical, and um, I think I would call it fairly realist. Um, in that, the for example, the art of say, to take a random example, Rubens is there because wealthy patrons paid him to make it, then paid to have it kept uh, well uh, in their uh, you know mansions, and then eventually they ended up in the hands of collectors in the modern day. Mm. Um, so, I think that. Uh, really, you know, from a modern perspective, we don't, we can't really say anything is ob objectively good. All we can do is say, well, if we take away the, um, say, reverence that people automatically have for Shakespeare, and we take away the critics and the academics, will his plays survive? And the answer is probably yes, because for a long time they did. They survived not because the masses necessarily won't, won't wanted to flock to see the plays. But because wealthy curators and literateurs and people would have, could afford to have these plays staged because they like them, because they're well, from my, in my opinion, and I'm sure in many other people's opinion, they are good plays. Um, mm. So people pay to have them kept on. You know, that's that's really what it comes down to: is are there people with the resources to keep these works of art? Uh, I don't really want to say functional because it's um, slightly too kind of uh, worth trans worth transmitting, maybe. Um, perhaps yes, to keep these things trans transmitted and kind of alive, I think might be the best word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's kind of the position that I would be at as well. Where um, <clears throat> we we know that the artworks contain what well, I would say again, like as a believer in uh, objective truth and beauty, I would say the art the art the artworks contain some metaphysical transcendent property. But it's it's not something that you can measure, you know, th through like a like a thermometer or whatever. And mm. so it's only through like I think that whole emphasis on time t time is super important. That's that's um, that's how you know something's yeah, I, good. I, I, I would say uh, I would say you but, can't uh, you can't have anything in the canon that's sort of less than fifty years old, really. I mean, yeah, I would I would say even longer. I mean, it's not clear to me that. Um, you know, the uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not this is not me making an argument against it or giving a view against it, because um, in many ways, I'm quite um, I quite enjoy it. But say the modernist start of 1890 to kind of 1920, let's say 100 years ago, it's still far too early to tell how long that will endure. You know, it, it could still be relevant in 300 years, 400 years, or it could be forgotten in the next 50 years if something else comes along. That, that displaces it in our collective uh, imagination. So I, I, I would say even to put to kind of try and work out when when exactly something passes into tra tradition is kind of a futile exercise. Yeah, uh, 
I think I, I think that's uh, that, that's kind of where I'm I'm roughly at as well. Um, just um, one one question I have though is around um, you know Panama. You're mentioning around the idea that um, you know um, I guess an, an elite was part of that transmission. But couldn't you argue that obviously today a certain artistic elite is transmitting, um, you know, what, what I think we would probably consider to be not good quality, good works of art is is what I've got to say. So, is is an elite always right, or you know, how do, how does that interplay? Well, I think that um, we have to remember that saying an elite is kind of like saying the workers, in that it's not. It doesn't really exist because there are so many different forms in the way an elite manifests itself. Um, I mean, my politi political position on elite caste is that it's unavoidable. Um, there will always be an elite. And the best way to kind of minimize the pain of that problem, if you will, is to have an aristocracy instead of a middle class elite um, that, you know, has a kind of inherited n nobility around it that prevents it falling into many of these pitfalls. So, or, or at least uh can for a while prevent that you know n nothing lasts forever but uh i would say that the elite of today are simply a symptom of today and um also that uh so many of our elites today are intertwined with the state and state money and state grants and um that's something to be careful of is that a lot of the, the, the um issues we find in contemporary art or certain types of contemporary art i should say because um, again, contemporary art is too uh, too narrow a term for too broad a topic. Um, we basically, uh, it, it, a lot of it is, is because of the situation we find ourselves in in terms of the power of state-funded state, state -funded in institutions in our art, really. That's, that's yeah. why the elite um, is. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, my, my take on the elite is that well, you can define it in different ways. You could say, well, it's the power brokers, it's the big collectors, it's the uh, auction houses. But you could also say the elite is people who love art. So it's people who really contribute, people who are really knowledgeable. So you could talk about the intellectual elite, um, the creative elite. So they are the, the leading artists of the day. Um, you could also, of course, there is the technical elite who are the the bureaucrats, they're also the funders, um, because now, of course, I, I don't think the state has a, obviously the state have, picks winners and it backs certain artists who, which meet its need. But then I think that ever the, what that ever was the case, you know, you'll find sort of princes and, and popes commissioning artists um, in the past. So obviously they were, they were, temporarily powerful as well as artistically powerful in the way that they could commission work. Um, so I would think there are, there are different elites on different levels, but then I think the point about the canon is that it's it's aggregate, it's cumulative, and it, and it um, comes over time. So I don't think we should worry about too much what the elite is saying today because fashion changes and new regimes come up and new tastes come up. So I think that whatever you, whatever concerns we have about uh, legitimate concerns about what various governments are doing in terms of funding particular types of art or pushing certain types of agenda through art, um, that they they will be washed away as well. Yeah, I, I, I guess um, because this has obviously happened before. I think in um, Alexander, you wrote uh, an article a while ago talking about the canon and, and tr tr tradition. And he mentioned uh, like an artist that was quite popular at the time that is now totally forgotten, for example. So we've already been through that process where mm. the, the elites of a time have, cho have chosen a certain s s series of artists to kind of promote yeah. and they've kind of been whittled down, as, haven't they? So. Yeah, that's it. I mean, obviously what happens is various, um, uh, various art critics or collectors or um, state sponsors, they put forward an artist. They say, this is the new great artist of our time. So there was, I was talking about uh, Anton Raphael Mengs, who was considered, um, uh, was a sort of a Dutch painter, I think, who was considered one of the great artists of the 17th century. You know, he was the he was the new Michelangelo. He was, um, uh, but he was he was forgotten very quickly. And you have like Bernard Buffet, who I also mentioned in the article, who was a French painter who came to 
before in the 1940s and 1950s. And by the time he died in the 1990s, everyone had forgotten about him. Um, so it doesn't matter what is proposed. If the general public don't respond, if artists, fellow artists don't respond, then these names will drop out of the canon. Um, and that's perfectly normal. But this will also means that you have a chance to see artists rise. So for example, um, Peter Bruegel, when he died, his art was in very high demand. Uh, Peter Bruegel, the uh, elder, he was in quite high demand. His son, Peter Bruegel, the younger, spent his entire life making, <laughs> making copies of his father's work. So you can tell how much demand there was for him. But then in the next two centuries, he completely dropped off the radar and he almost was sort of completely disappeared from the canon and he was only revived in the late 19th century. So artists fall out of favour. I mean, but now, of course, Peter Bruegel is now one of the essential artists of the Western canon. Yeah, definitely. I think I think that's um, yeah, some really good points there. Um, okay, so moving on to the second question, um, what do we think the value of tradition and the canon is? Um, Phoebus, what's your thoughts on that? Oh, hello. Um, the value. Um, it's well, I think I think uh, in order to I don't know to see where we're going, we need to see where we have been as a culture. Um, yeah, like on the individual basis, how has how has art worked? Uh, how has it sort of evoked various things in people um, and the craft as well? Um, yeah, how do you create it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, Panama, what's your thoughts? The value of tr tradition. Um, I would say the only real value in that sense that it has is that you, you should think of the traditional canon as a kind of um, museum that's been made via a fine tooth comb that's kind of combed through 2,000 years of Western history and has largely picked up items of quality. And it could be, and the only quality that it measures by is the fact that these things have endured up to now. That we can that, that they've been enjoyed for so long, and presumably continue to be enjoyed now. Um, that's that's the quality it picks up. So that's really the value of it is that it 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 collates it collates the um, peaks of the mountain range, if you will, while it leaves the rest of things behind that we can only hope uh, were not worthy of uh, being carried forward. Alex, are you, you going you to come in? Yeah, um, I think that the value of tradition is that um, it honours and transmits the great art that has gone before and the art that you, has influenced you and your people, and you wish to transmit this to the next generation. Um, obviously, it involves craft, um, technical things, uh, also sort of human insights as well, and that... Um, this is something also that something that you should learn, even if you want to break the rules later, even if you want to develop new things, you have to have this foundation of understanding your craft, your tradition, your values before you go on to do something new. So I think that that's, um, and the canon is basically a distillation of that. And of course it, it is necessarily exclusive because it can only be the very pinnacles, as, as Panama says, it can only be the very pinnacles of the very best that has come before. So you sometimes get this, this opposition from uh, feminists and they say, oh, you know, there should be more women in the canon and they propose this or that artist. And then you look at them and you think, well, okay, they're pretty good, but they're not as good as, are they, are they as good or better than Rembrandt? or Rubens or whatever. And you look at them and you say, well, actually, there's a reason they're not in the canon. They're not as good as that. And also you have a problem of inertia. So if you had two, if you discovered an artist who was as, as good in every way as Rembrandt, working about the same time as Rembrandt, maybe in Germany or something or Denmark or something, would you go to the trouble of 
replacing some of the art of Rembrandt with this new artist. And the thing is that the, uh, the, the art that is by Rembrandt is already well known. It's already well in circulation. It's a common currency. It's like, a, like an idiom or a phrase which is already used. It's already embedded. And inertia tends to win out. So even if you had art that was as good as that, you probably couldn't insert it because inertia is going to win out. Um, uh, yeah. I would just, sorry. No, you go. Um, I would just like to basically reinforce what Alex said, that it's a golden rule. If we're going to establish one thing on this stream, we must establish, I think, that you nobody can tinker with the canon. The only way you can it alter the, you, you, well, you, you can't alter the canon. You can only mm. add to it. Um, yeah possibly uh with with your own artwork if it endures but uh yeah as he said basically you um many modern academics and kind of critics seem to be unaware of the fact that you can't just kind of wave a magic wand and insert you know random people or random artworks into the traditional canon um be, because well for whatever reason they haven't endured in a in a kind of major way to, to be to be in, in included in it you know and there's probably a reason for that um e even if as you said there are perfectly rational you know perfectly sound reasons and arguments as to why they should be there the fact is if they aren't then they just aren't it's just not in your power to, to add them in at, at will and um there was something else you said before that uh god it's just slipped out of my head um i think it was about um being exclusive, inertia. Uh, no, slightly before that, I think. Uh, oh, it's, it. Um, it honors and transmits what we've what we've considered valuable or the best. Um, God, no, don't worry. Uh, it, it's gone. I don't. I don't want to slow everything down. <laughs> okay. I'll sure sure come back you to you later at a very inconvenient time. I'm sure. Yeah, you you have to think about that. Uh, like, I, I guess your point around um, the feminism, uh, Alexander, is something that's. I often hear when speaking to, um, you know, certainly kind of um, I mean, y younger people these days, um, <clears throat> you know, an argument I've often heard is obviously today society is very much different to that of the past. Why, like, why can't we have um, a canon that's more, uh, you know, more representative of what today's society looks like? Um, specific, like, obviously... The place of women has changed, like you said, um, quite dramatically. Um, you know, why shouldn't we have, um, you know, fifty percent of the historical artworks um, <laughs> done, done done by women? Say, say, it, say it with a straight face, Pharaoh. Say it with a straight <laughs> face. I dare you. Okay. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. Let's take this apart then. Okay. So first of all, you can't you can't remove right. First of all, it's not top down it's not controlled you can't impose it this is what feminists and authoritarians and marxists hate because they want to they think you can engineer everything they are they are authoritarians they are utopians they are social constructionists they think that you can design things to work in a particular way the whole point about the point about the canon is it's organic and it's aggregate it's crowdsourced so it can't be controlled from the top. Also, if you start removing art like, or you start removing Rembrandt because you're gonna make way for Judith Leister, for example, who's a Dutch painter of the same period. But the problem is if you start removing Rembrandt, then you're not going to be understand, you're not going to understand the art that came after Rembrandt that refers back to Rembrandt. Okay, because it's not gonna make sense because you can have all these artists like sort of, Hopper and Whistler and all these other artists who are referring back to Rembrandt specifically because they were excited and influenced by his work. So if you remove Rembrandt, the work that comes back comes later is not going to make complete sense because there's going to, it's going to be referring back to sort of a black hole where an artist was but has now been replaced by Judith Leister, a decent uh, painter, I... but not you know not not Rembrandt. I guess going back to your uh, analogy of the narrative is is like having a book where one chapter has been removed or redacted and mm. re replaced by something totally different, but all of those plot points and little intricacies that made the the following chapters make sense have now been mm. um, you know be, been removed. And I, and I guess I, I guess the other thing is obviously um, 
to make a decision on the canvas to apply a, a value judgment which in itself is to talk about objective good isn't it, it mm. what you're saying what you're saying is that it's um if it's good enough to be in the canon it's good enough to be there it's good yes. enough to be transmitted and I, I would also say there's this fallacy that obviously that thomas soul talks about you know that the talent must be distributed equally amongst people and the only reason that people are not certain demographic groups are not represented equally is because they've been held back or they've been diverted into other things or their work has been um, excluded or silenced it's not true more more so some people are going to be naturally drawn to the fine arts some people are going to be naturally drawn to sports or more to architecture than they are towards film or photography or so forth so there's a natural inclination towards different areas and uh, talent and hard work are not naturally distributed. You know, even I'm not talking about between different demographics or different sexes. You can just say, you know, between different families, between different individuals in the same family, skills are not equally distributed. So you're not going to have an e So when you look at the overall layout, you're going to get certain groups that do more than other groups. Um, and it's the same way in professions. You know, you see a lot more women go into nursing and teaching. Men go into more construction, industry, engineering, and so forth. These are natural proclivities. Also, you have to remember that women were discouraged and or excluded from the... Prof hmm. They had, let's, let's just say they had impediments to becoming fine artists before the late 19th century. So there were just simply fewer professional artists who were female. So therefore you have fewer good professional female artists. Um, so naturally, when you don't have any such impediments for men or rather the, there are impediments for men, but they're different. So you're going to have fewer women artists who are at the same level as the very best of the men. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you can't go back and look for all these old mistresses who have been excluded in favor of the old masters because to be frank there are very few of them and female feminist art, art historians have been doing this for decades and decades and decades and they've not had particularly good returns so those are another reason why we can't simply go back and add in women yeah, that, that, I think that's interesting about just the sheer number of uh, people. Phoebus, have you got something to jump in with? Yes, well, I, so I, I recognize that there's a sort of, there are certain um, uh, less noble motives for going back and uh, inorganically changing the canon. But I do think we ought to be careful that we're not too reactive and the canon does correctly evolve because it's you know because it's uh you know because it's including a, a woman or, or someone from another group um i, I completely agree I th and the thing is that this has already happened if you look at uh, gwen john or louise bourgeois or um camille claudel they've all been added into the canon and artemisia gentileschi who has her own exhibition in the national gallery at the moment um all very good artists and all well worth studying and they've all been absorbed i just think i think that the canon does it does take note of these artists when they're put forward and they seem good enough and people are excited enough by them i think hmm. i might challenge that um because i think if i'm correct uh please correct me if this is wrong but uh they were those uh women you talk about were essentially added into the canon fairly recently weren't they we're talking sort of last 50 years uh no i think i think gwen john was already admired in the 1940s uh gentileschi was not was not a particularly big name but there were other artists like marietta robusti who was the daughter of tintoretto she had quite a high reputation at the end of the 16th century um she's faded since um i don't think that they're uh um it it it's it, it's a difficult one um talking about I mean, reputation could these, could these um women maintain their place in the canon firstly without the academic and secondly 
without the current um, kind of wave of feminism. Say, let's imagine a society in 400 years where uh, kind of fem feminism is at, the, is at the level it was in, say, 1500. It's, it's not really a concept. Um, could would would those women still be admired then? Do you think? Mm, I think I think some of some of them would. I think because there there are a lot of people who very much like uh, Frida Kahlo, for example. Um, but, but again, and, uh, I mean, it, it, I think with Frida Kahlo, it's simply too early to say whether they're really part of the canon. They're, they're part of the of of our more recent canon, and obviously she's you know a very well known artist. Um, what is it, 50, 60, 70 years after her death? Uh, but you know. Yeah. Will will she will she still be will she, will her and her art be remembered in the kind of mainstream canon in five hundred years? Or... I, th I think I, I, well, I, th I think you're correct that I don't I don't think there are going to be any f female Michelangelos. I don't think um, uh, Artemisia is going to be ever as famous as um, Canova and Bernini and so forth. Um, but that's simply because I don't think they were that big at the time, and they don't. So, yeah, well, I guess we'll have to find out, won't we? I mean, if just on that point, it, it's a little bit off topic, but um, my uh, thoughts on kind of great women artists um, enduring throughout the canon is that essentially, uh, in in the next, in the sort of uh, immediate or perhaps long future, depending on how things change, um, given the status that women now have, if there are uh, female artists that can paint great works or sculpt great work or write great work or compose great work and um, these things endure um, independent of current fashions and current trends and a kind of you know um, active hunger for female artists then you know more power to them um, but the other thing to remember is that feminism is something that it, it's it's you, you can only reach societal kind of feminism when it's at the, the long end of a uh, a whole a whole kind of raft of you know in enlightenment thought and you know h hundreds of years of progressivism so it's entirely possible that if uh women are, are unable to produce enduring work in the period of time while feminism is still viable and still popular then yes they can but if if, if not then um then that's why I think there'll be many more Michelangelo's, but you know, no, no, no female iteration. I, th I, th I think there's an interesting point around. I mean, we'll talk more about the future later. Um, you know, I, th I think Frida's a really good example because obviously she does have a very uh, large uh, popularity, but it, she's also you know a key figure in the feminist movement at the same time. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, that, that certainly has contributed. Yeah, yeah, she fits and, and, very, very comfortably in sort of our current sensibilities. Unlike yeah. maybe uh, uh, Lempika, for example, who's perhaps mm -hmm. um, more on the right, well, I mean, perhaps. I mean, Frida Kahlo's kind of um, rebel progressive um, streak, I think, endears her currently. Um, but I mean, this is this is again. I'm slightly veering off here, but um, thinking of someone like, say, Sartre, um, whose work has had something of a re revival recently because of the amount he wrote on existentialism. But for a good while, about forty years or so, he was essentially an, an unperson um, in literary circles because he embraced Maoism towards the end of his life, which even in the kind of you know uh, highly left wing kind of esoteric academics circles at that time was very unpopular and kind of unacceptable to the same degree that somebody declaring themselves a fascist would, would be you know it was just not you, you couldn't be a it was just not morally acceptable to be a maoist so and he, even now kind of his work is uh you know there's there's a kind of stigma attached to him and his work um that that uh that i think is influenced by that so depending on how we view the politics of, of certain people in the future, then again, you have to wonder how long can their works be uh, maintained in the canon? I, I, that, that leads on nicely to another question I had. So obviously the sensibilities of today are very different to those of the past. 
um, what if there's a conflict between the um, the artist and you know what we consider today to be acceptable? Just to give an example, I'm thinking uh, you know Eric Gill, uh, who mm. let's just say had a very colourful <laughs> personal life. Mm. Um, she, like, shouldn't we just cancel the parts of the canon that uh, uh, you know don't match up to? today's sensibilities in, in, well where do, where do you end i mean for, well then the next one to go is caravaggio for, as a as a killer or murderer or not i don't know homicide for sure and then you've got a whole list of uh, retrogrades and criminals who come after that and many of them were good artists and well you know uh leonardo da vinci was um convicted of sodomy so i, I suppose i don't know if that gives him advantage or disadvantage in today's climate but um, no, I, d I don't think you can start. Um, it, it, obviously, it, it influences how you feel about the art, um, whether you personally consume it or how you react to it on a personal level. But I don't think. But obviously, the point about a canon is that it's not. Um, it's not top down. It's not. Um, it's not um, regulated. It's not in the control of an academy or a um even academia so it's not it's not a question of excluding i think that um the art itself will will win out um do, I, mean, I mean just on this point of regulation but sh but surely if we're going to transmit it to the future we need to say this is what it is um and so we do need to make a judgment call on what that is sh sh Surely, well, on on the on the contents on the contents of the art, yes, you might mm -hmm. find the contents of some art particularly despicable, but also it might be influential. So, for example, you've got Celine, who is uh, they've had trouble republishing Celine in France because of his anti-Semitic uh, writings, but he's a, an important modernist artist. Um, the the Beats, you know. Um, William Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg did some rather questionable things, but they are iconic writers. Um, I, I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm personally not a fan of sort of cancelling anyone uh, other than for inadequacy in performing their function as an artist. Just, just going back to this idea of um, the kind of the value of the canon, I, I think what everyone was talking about sort of aligned. Uh, you know, Panama Electra idea of it's that kind of the eternal museum that anyone can enter into. And it's that idea of, um, you know, it, these ideas of transmission and training and passing something on. But again, if I'm putting my uh, left wing hat on for the for the evening, you know, they, they might say, isn't this just um, propaganda? Um, you know, it, it's you're just listening to propaganda from the past. Sounds what's, like what's projection that? to me. <laughs> my mic is on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Sorry, yeah, I th yeah. I th you just, I, I think, just keep on talking because I think it just cuts out a little no, bit. It, it, it wasn't that. It's that um, I think the screen I've got the um, Freeman is actually frozen, so I can't actually <laughs> see, see what's going on. <laughs> uh, but yeah, sorry. Um, so could you just reiterate the question for me? Sorry, because I was thinking about this. Mic. Um, you know, what is the difference between propaganda and tradition? Sh surely you're just kind of just in the same way that uh, you know. Um, you know, your grandfather may, you know, try and get you to do something because that's the way that his father told him to do it. Isn't well, that about the same as tradition? I think, um, see that, again, it's one of those kind of quite awkward questions to throw out there because it, these, as you say, these questions are kind of tailored to, to, to plummet people like us. <laughs> but, uh, um, so I, I think that the, the, you have to be taught the traditions, because what else are you going to teach the young? Like what? What is a, a a a young artist? No matter how brilliant, can't just conjure up uh, great works out of nothing, or any artwork out of nothing. Really, they, you you have to start with something, and that's what the that's what the value of tradition is artistically. Is that you kind of inherit um, all of, all of these things that you then uh, you can then choose to utilize. I mean. Obviously, I think people in our sort of circle would say, well, yes, you should utilize these traditions. But the reality on the ground is that an artist, as long as they understand the traditions they come from, doesn't necessarily have to choose to use them. And of course, you, you could make the argument that it, it's, it's unavoidable, that, 
simply by learning these things, you, it, it, it then manifests itself in your own output. So I, again, mm. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to refuse to say whether or not there's a value to this because I, I don't really um, like that vein of thinking. But if it does have a value, then that is certainly one of the uh, major tenets of it. I, I would I would say one of the things is its efficiency. It allows you to do your work because you are taught, oh, if you want to do this particular effect, this is the way you do it. If you want to learn how to do anatomy, here is a book. Follow the rules in this book and you will be able to get anatomy fairly correct. It's a shorthand. It's a way of becoming more effective in your craft. Now, of course, because craft has been somewhat disdained and there is this sort of rupture, now, when you go to art school, because I went to art school, um, what you do is you sort of you, you have to teach yourself and your tutors come in and discuss the ideas with you afterwards. They're not necessarily there showing you how to draw anatomy or, um, or you know, what the what the table of colors are, you know, what the color circle is. They're they're coming in to sort of intellectually spar with you. Um, but the uh, but the idea of the tran the transmission is it makes things more more effective for you because you don't have to reinvent the wheel they give you the wheel they tell you what you can do with the wheel and then you go on to either do that or to do something else with it yeah that, I, I think there's some good points from both of you guys there so like um the idea of you know rather than you making your own decisions now you've got the advice of a thousand people a thousand generations before you that you, uh, that you can either listen to or you don't i think that's the key point you don't um ex accepting tradition doesn't necessarily mean you have to follow it um to the t and and if anything um you know i i guess doing exactly the same thing as the past is discouraged in many ways isn't it so um you, you it's always that interplay between novelty and tradition as well um you know obviously in in certain forms of art like i'm thinking byzantine uh, iconic art they often just get stuck in stuck in a <laughs> stuck in a bit of a rut where they're producing um, exactly the same art. But art also, there the, are the traditions like, for example, the Chinese tradition is that you go and study with the master and you learn to emulate the master to become almost uh, a carbon copy of the master, and that this is how you show that you have attained your level of achievement is by matching your master and by following him. And this is, but but this is to do with particular traditions especially craft traditions which don't tend to evolve very much or evolve very slowly so there is a premium on continuity rather than innovation obviously in the west we have a slightly different situation at the moment and certainly in the last 500 years where um, um, originality and innovation has replaced the importance of continuity but it's, it's a balance yeah, I, I guess one of the criticisms I would have for contemporary art today is that it's just pure novelty and no, no ties to the past or tradition whatsoever. Um, just, just going back to the, the that, sorry, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I hate to play kind of um, sort of devil's advocate, but I think that in many ways, um, even though the a lot of contemporary art um, isn't or at least tries to distance itself from what we would consider to be the proper canon. Um, it it in it kind of weirdly ends up forming its own canon in that no artwork is truly independent. You can see the influences of other postmodern artworks on uh, contemporary art, and you can even see because of course most of these artists went to art school, um, and many of and of course e even if they didn't, they've come into contact with the traditional canon because it's quite literally unavoidable you know you can't really um get to the point where you can produce uh i i i'm i'm again at this i may be wrong here but i don't think you can really get to the point where you can say uh write books people will actually buy and read or make art people will actually buy and and and, and collect without um some sort of understanding even in the most cursory way of the canon so I'm kind of purely on a theoretical level. I'm skeptical of the idea that um, there is you can really be truly original. Um, I think what these people are trying to do is break away from something that they are inevitably chained to. So I agree with the general gist of what you're saying. I just don't think that 
they are actually being original. Yeah, like, I, I guess all, all I would say is, it, like, I think you've got a choice when creating an artwork. You can either like uh, do a, a copy of the past, and that's just pure pure traditionalism in in the form of uh, you know Bruegel the younger or whatever copying his father mm. or you know workshop painting etc. Or you have pure pure novelty where your aim is to create something totally new. I, I, like I, I do I do see your, your point is that you can never nothing is one hundred percent new. But I think if you see the number of uh, new kind of artistic forms or um, the attempts to increasingly shock and um, su- surprise people, um, th- well, they're kind of the- right on the other end of the spectrum. So. Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's always a drive to certainly uh, when I say originality, I mean, obviously, obviously I don't mean sort of sui generis, you know, not sort of out of thin air, but there's a, there's a, you need to distinguish yourself in, in Western art. Now, of course, there is the, there is the, the whole idea of um, the individual as being, um, because in the, typically in the West, the individual is valued slightly more higher than in the east where the where the group is uh, valued slightly more but when i say sort of originality it's just a, it's just a question of distinguishing yourself from your master so taking something from your master from your tradition uh, but also distinguishing yourself from your master by doing something new or applying it in a new way or using new materials and also distinguishing yourself from your peers so maybe it's not so much originality as a way of distinguishing yourself, making yourself perhaps more marketable. Mm. Yeah, and, and the, like, I guess the areas of novelty that I would talk about are you know, subject, medium, um, symbology. Those are the things that you can can vary and and mm. uh, yeah generate. But obviously, you're tied into. Um, uh, you, you are you are tied to those other other artists, but for example, the, you know the first um, you know video artist, for example, um, you know that's a, that is a new medi- medium. So I pres- presume that, mm. uh, that there's got to be there's got to be one original, you know. And then, of course, once you reach the stage of Bill Viola, you spend all your time making video installations that imic, uh, Im- imitate Renaissance paintings. <laughs> so. Mm. <laughs> Okay, nice. Um, let, let's go on. Let's. I think we talked a lot about definitions, the value. Um, I, I wanted to go into kind of state of play um, right right now, both academically. You know, we we talked about the difference between the academics, the uh, I guess the kind of elites in uh, the elites and artists, so the people who are buying and uh, commissioning, but also making the making the works, and also just the. Um, you know the common man as well. Those three people. Where do we think we are um, currently with those uh, with, with the state of the canon? And um, yeah, where it's at. I don't know if anyone that jumps in. <laughs> After you guys, I've been talking more than you, so I think I think someone else should speak. Um, I would suggest that Phoebus go first. Uh, I think. <laughs> If if I'm uh, if I'm not wrong, he he works in graphic uh, illustration. But... Yes, well, um, I mean, in terms of fine art or high art, um, I don't think we're in a good place. Um, I mean, it's completely at the service of sort of finance, pretty much, um, and we have uh, it's commissioned by an elite that's not rooted anywhere. Um, and doesn't really value it as art. Uh, I think the the traditions of uh, can only really be found in uh, design um, of cars or graphic design um, stuff that has a relation with uh, with people with culture. So, so just kind of build, building on from that. So on the kind of in the kind of elite space, we've moved away from those, I guess, kind of like um, an elite aristocracy or um, you know uh, um, elite leaders to, um, I guess, corporate commissioners. Um, you know, art as an asset um, has has that affected the canon? 
so and, and Phoebus is saying yes in a negative way because it's they're un unrooted. I think that's a really an interesting point around you know a bank um, fundamentally, uh, sorry, international bank doesn't care about the canon because it um, you know it it doesn't need tradition because it is international by its nature. Um, anyone else got thoughts on that? I mean, I would uh, I would have to say this goes back to the uh, the point I made at the start of the stream um, about the fact that in um, certain societies the elite is an aristocracy, and in our society the elite is an oligarchy, and this is just uh, you know a kind of fact of life when you live under um, an oligarchy as opposed to an aristocracy is that um, the kind of Again, here comes that word again. The value of uh, of the art is kind of uh, lost somewhere, and in a way, it becomes the the actual value of art is just is the the value of art for me at least is not just how much it costs. Um, and even though the the cost people are willing to pay in a realist sense is important, it's not. It doesn't really factor into the art itself. Whereas, as as someone pointed out, n nowadays that's all that matters. Is that you know the fact that wealthy oligarchs are willing to pay uh, enormous sums of money um, for for, the, for certain types of art? I mean, and yes, it, you know that's how it's always been, but it's just the nature of the elites in this case. I, I would say I would say it has it, there, there is a key difference here in the past, and it's like yes, elites of all kind have paid large sums of money for for art. But with the with the, there is a distinct change with the art becoming an asset because the value to a bank of buying a, a painting isn't isn't how much you pay the money uh, that well it typically isn't the um, just the value that you put, you uh, get for paying for the painting it's the return on investment you'll get from it so you're you're expecting it to accrue in value as time goes on or to to beat inflation so its value is. Um, just purely monetary, monetary, uh, monetary, you know. While obviously the kind of the value to people in the past is much more complicated uh, than that. Um, Alex, absolutely. Yeah, I, I I agree completely. I think it's interesting the way Phoebus was talking about sort of uh, rootlessness. I've just written a review for the the critic, uh, which has appeared online, uh, which was about late Stalinism and. Um, uh, <laughs> Stalin in his last years went a little bit, um, let's say he, went, he was prejudiced against a certain group in the, in the last years, and he talked about rootless cosmopolitanism, <laughs> which was supposed to, which was a, a synonym for a, a certain religious minority that we're not going to discuss. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, so so there is this idea of, 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 of a rootless person having no loyalties, and a rootless person being detached from tradition, which of course is it's not entirely fair when you're talking about um, people. But when you're talking about art, it's actually in to the advantage of investors who, who treat art as an investment to make it rootless. So this is why you have, um, this is why you have, uh, um, you have art which is uh, essentially detached from its own traditions, which is circulated internationally through um, through art fairs, through biennales, through international art publications. And so you can go to an art fair in Sharjah or Qatar or Miami or Basel, and you'll see the same art there. There's, there's absolutely no difference in the art that you see. I mean, actually, if you just if you just opened your eyes and looked, you would not be able to tell what even what continent you're on, because there would be a Jeff, there would be uh, there would be a um, Jeff Jeff Coons, there would be a Gormley, there would be uh, Damien Hurst, there'd be uh, Rothko, some good Rothkos or bad Rothkos or whatever, and you would be seeing the same sort of material, which has now become a commodity, which is now internationally traded, and the idea is that you open up more markets, and the more markets that you open up the more the elites in these particular markets will uh, want to acquire particular artworks as a status symbol of not only their wealth and their status, but also as a symbol of their attachment to international cosmopolitanism. Um, so this is so this is one thing that is particularly driving the art market. Um, and you've seen that this is now detached from personal choice. This is actually 
bought as an investment and often it's bought by an advisor who says this particular artist is going up very well at the moment this particular art is um, uh, non-taxable in its uh, increase in value so if you put your money into um, into a Damien Hurst it will do better than uh, a share portfolio yeah I, I think there's a really interesting point around the kind of corruptive power of um, the, the value of art so what, we're, what I guess what we're saying is um, we're, we're the canon establishes you know um, uh, objective value through this whittling process through time and all of that gets replaced by a system where it's like the um, the the the, uh, the best art is the art that's um, appreciating in value most, or again has the best uh, tax uh, tax benefits. But I, th I think there's an interesting corruptive nature on local art scenes based on it. So you mentioned again like Qatar and the Saudis. Like like I, I heard that the Saudis opened up like a they spent like millions and millions of uh, pounds. Um, opening up a large gallery, um, which they just filled filled with like American artists. So, mm. uh, like, I guess, I guess the Saudis would have had some kind of uh, artistic tradition, the tr tradition of Islam, um, etc. Et and all of that's been corrupted and superseded by this rootless international, uh, uh, like, an anti canon um, that's going to sweep sweeping uh -huh. through and re well, re in, in, replace well, in, new stuff. In, yeah. Well, interestingly, I do have in the new book, um, which is called um, Iconoclasm, Identity, Politics and the Erasure of History. I had to get in this the is, plug. This is good. This is, yes, for, Steve, for, Steve for, for, uh, plug, yeah. Abs absolutely. I, I can't tell you how much that I love your subscribers. So I, I don't have a channel, so you can't subscribe to me, but you can buy my fantastic book. Um, but anyway, so in that book, I have a chapter on Wahhabism and Wahhabism is kind of really interesting because it's specifically iconoclastic. So they have spent uh, now uh, the, the family of Saud came to power in an alliance with the Wahhabis and Wahhabism is basically a destruction of all icons. They are absolutely opposed to all icons. And this includes not only icons, but also historical monuments and historical art. So the Saudis are in a bit of a bind because their national culture is to destroy culture. It's to destroy the material culture. It even intent, they, they destroyed, um, uh, they destroyed the historic fort that was next to the Kaaba. They wanted uh, to demolish their, the Wahhabis in the, whenever they took over the, the house of Saud, whenever they took over Mecca from the Turks, because the Turks actually controlled it for a while. They went through and they destroyed graveyards. They destroyed places associated with the Prophet, which is a fascinating thing that you've got devout Muslims destroying Muslim history. And they actually wanted to destroy the tomb of uh, the Prophet Muhammad, um, but they were just foiled because it was uh, too robustly built. Um, so <laughs> you've got, you've got, you've got, you've got a to... better metaphor. <laughs> Yeah, that's absolutely. So, so um, yeah. So the, the Saudis are kind of, so that's kind of like a diversion. But yeah, but n now you have um, what is it? The, the Qatar branch of the Louvre. The Louvre has yeah. opened a new branch, and I think that's. Uh, uh, I yeah, think I mean, it. Hi, I think it highly great. unwise. I think it highly unwise sending your art, your Western, your decadent Western art, to a country which um, believes in destroying such things. I think that's slightly think we'll um, do... injudicious. Make a note of the phrase: "The Louvre has opened a new branch," as if as if it was Nat West. Well, oh, well it has it has it has two already. It's got the it's got the Paris and it's got the Mets branch. So this is at, this is literally I mean, the you, third branch. Yeah, I know. I mean, point, grotesque, isn't it? I mean, you made the point earlier about the uh, art being essentially entirely connected to high finance, but I mean that that that's 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 the nexus of it. The Louvre has opened a new branch. It's <laughs> it's perfect. It's the I think. Um, funny enough, talking about um, I iconoclasm, I think that as a phrase would be the kind of symbol um, of of this stream. I think for what we discussed. Mm. Um, okay, so that's that's the kind of elites commissioning the arts. What about what's happening in, in academic circles, uh, Alexander? Obviously, been a, a little while since you've been to art school, but um, what was their what was what was their view on the canon? So, so again, Panama. Sorry, no. Um, I sorry, I thought you were gonna um 
uh, move on to a different topic, but no, that's on the same thing. It's fine. So. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so um, Alexander, so when you, you when you're at school, what's what was the general kind of academic view of the canon at, uh, yeah, at uni? No. At uni, well, I have to stress that I went to university at Goldsmiths, which is kind of like the epicenter of wokeness and political correctness. Um, but this was back in the 1990s. So at the time we did, half of it was um, regular straight art history. And then the other half was uh, queer theory and Marxism and psychoanalysis and uh, feminism. And there was this, there was this like, there was this, <laughs> there was this great tension because you had like, you were going between lectures, and one half you were getting sort of the traditional art history, and then the other half was saying, well, basically the the, the, the traditional half doesn't doesn't really matter. The canon is is imposed to assert the so and so hegemony of the bottom call it, you know. Uh, I think I think a lot things are changing because I think that people are reacting quite strongly because they're seeing the influence of um, the Frankfurt School and neo-Marxism and feminism and uh, decolonization, especially in, in the museum sector. I think people are seeing the upshot of this and they're getting and they're kind of rethinking, oh, they're maybe we were a little bit too tolerant towards uh, neo-Marxism and so forth because of the consequences, the consequences including um, basically, museums deciding that they are essentially museums are, are, are basically embarrassed to have any um, art at all because it, it's so sort of loaded with, you know, the sort of uh, associations with uh, pillaging and destruction and a cultural appropriation and so forth. So they, they so basically a lot of a lot of people who are managing venues are basically venue managers. Uh, who've been who've got sort of doses of um, neo-marxism and feminism and so forth and they just want to be basically running a community center they want to be running a social mm. activism center they don't want to be running a museum at all um in academia it it, it varies i'm you know I, I i review a lot of books um for different publications so i get to see i get to keep my finger on the pulse occasionally and it does seem that I think we're going to get a reaction against it. But unfortunately, the people who have been trained to think as social activists who are now in positions in museums and arts organizations and charities, which are, are basically political organizations, they see it's now their opportunity to say, you know, no white comfort in the art museum sector. Mm, that's interesting. Um Phoebus, I don't know if, um, from from a graphic perspective, that such stuff was brought up on the canon much at all. But um, I don't know from your kind of friendship group and stuff. How, how do you feel uh, at the kind of nope. academic feel right. was uh, when you're at uni? Um, well, hey. so yeah. the, my study was mainly on uh, the practice. Um, would have contextual lectures, so would cover arts and crafts, uh, modernism, postmodernism, um, Bauhaus. Um, yeah, it was primarily the, the library you'd have to go to to uh, uh, find your context. But uh, it was quite patchy in practice. And, uh, and, and I guess, was it kind of presented fairly kind of straightforward, like this is... You know, great art, great art and crafts, or you know, this is why it's problematic. Or uh, there'd be a bit of both. There'd be a bit of both. Um, there'd be, yeah, taking it at face value, and then maybe questioning aspects, um, leaving a bit of doubt in there. Okay, cool. Uh, I, I mean, all, all I can talk about is my uh, my, my sister. He's doing a uh, literary degree in London right now, so I, I kind of go through her course and. Um, uh, you know, just see what she's going through, and and, and again, I think it's that interesting. Um, the canon still still taught those key texts are still still taught, but I, I do think that that, that um, there is a lot of subversion at the same time. Um, you know, a, a lot of stuff is only put on so they can do. Um, okay, from, from a theatre perspective or whatever, uh, you know, people love 
um, kind of, I wouldn't say messing up, but having new takes on Shakespeare, let's just say. That's that's the novelty of, of the canon, is being able to um, adapt it and, uh, I guess, cauterize it for, for modernity. So I, I think... I think what is interesting is that it hasn't been completely abandoned, um, but at the same time, it's def- at the very least subverted and maybe, you know, constantly challenged. Um, okay, so, so that's uh, if I could Academia. Do- I, don't, I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts on that kind of... Hey, if yeah, I could go, go, uh, go back a sec. Well, I mean, um, I'm not really uh, involved in the visual arts beyond a kind of um, quite deep interest in it, but I I, I don't uh, draw or anything. I'm, I'm not I'm not an artist in that sense, and I don't uh, buy a lot of I don't buy any contemporary art um, in in that sense. I buy uh, portraits um, of uh, you know people that in, uh, interest me, but other than that, nothing. So the only um, and I didn't study an artistic subject at university. I studied law instead, even though I'm uh, my main interest is literature. Uh, because I didn't want to put up with, you know, um, lectures essentially, uh, mm. and I wanted to basically spend the time studying uh, proper, uh, well, basically studying the actual canon. Um, but the only subject area I'm really qualified to talk about in that sense is uh, poetry and novels, uh, because I, um, I don't think I talked about this on live stream before, but I am a published poet, um, and I do have a book. Uh, poetry coming out next year uh, by the looks of it um and and a novel chill uh, chill but I, no, I can't <laughs> fill them yet because i'm not there, uh, <laughs> unfortunately I, I would love to do a steve turley but i can't but um <laughs> the only uh so so basically in terms of um literature well for one poetry has been basically sleepwalking for some time it, it can never really be dead but it, it's sleepwalking um basically because i think the real um, nexus of poetry is that it it, it encapsulates um, very broad human experiences from a very personal perspective, um, or at least that's what makes poetry endure. Uh, and what's happened is basically when the kind of beat movement ended and when kind of, um, you know, um, when postmodernism set in, it really hit poetry the hardest. If you think, if you look at poetry as kind of the poorest area of the kind of of the canon, um, then poetry is kind of the worst hit by the by the flood. If you see what I mean? Um, it because what happens is poetry turns. Uh, it it all poetry is internal, but it turned inward in a way that really did a lot of harm because all poets have talked about since the nineties, or at least all the poets that get published in mainstream magazines have talked about is their own feelings in an extremely turgid and kind of fringe way. Um, mm-hmm. And if you, if you open up a, a copy of poetry magazine, which, which uh, kind of made poets like Ezra Pound and Dylan Thomas famous. Uh, now all you'll find is kind of transgenders moaning about how hard it is to be a, a, a transgender person. You know, that's, mm-hmm. that's all you'll find. It, it doesn't really encapsulate anything beyond personal grievances um so or at least it, it very rarely does or it does it in a very turgid way so that's where poetry is as an art and uh novels um the, the sort of novel that we're sort of every two years uh you know people like people will write articles in the guardian and the telegraph when you have a novel has finally died and you know they've, they've been doing this since 1955 now um but the the thing is that again the novel like visual art can't really die because it's such an it's just you know writing things down long form won't ever go away i don't think um but the state of that is again it's and like like art it, it's commercialized it in a very um different way it's commercialized in the sense that uh publishers need to sell in order to publish the book so um i get i i i would say that the uh, novels are too broad um, to be really uh, affected in such a way. And again, like like visual art, there are simply too many people writing novels in different ways to really say that, oh, you know, the, the modern uh, writer is bad. Or, you know, like saying, 
all all modern art is trash. You know, saying that all modern books are bad is just too much of a broad statement to make. Well, so, I I, th I think we've we've got two problems. One is that the general standard has been lowered. Also, the problem is that you're losing you're losing your gatekeepers. We could actually do with some gatekeepers to say these these are the five these are the five or the ten really most essential uh, writers who you should know who are working at the moment. Of course, read others as well. But we don't have these authority figures. We've lost we've lost trust in critics because um, well, I don't know. Well, because we've we've lost trust in the idea of the canon. We're suspicious of it. We've been taught through our universities for the last 40 or 50 years that the canon is a device for imposing the will of the majority or the will of the elites upon people, which it's not at all. The whole point about the canon is it's diffuse, it's aggregate, it's crowdsourced, it's always changing. And so we've been lied to about the nature of the canon. And I think that also traditionalists, and I think all four of us are broadly traditionalists in this way, I think that we have been lied, we lie to ourselves as well. We tell ourselves that the canon is a sword that will that will smite the 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 the, the dragon of postmodernism of vapid self-promotion and marketing it will destroy bad art but the problem is if you accept what the canon is you have to accept that the canon will evolve and that you cannot control the canon and that the canon does not determine what is good or bad it simply det determines what is important and memorable and what you need to transmit to the next generation not necessarily what is the best and beautifulest mm, yeah interesting. i agree with that Okay, so moving on to next discussion point around uh, angles of attack. How has the canon um, been assaulted? Um, I mean, we talked about um, the kind of fe feminist point around uh, a reappraisal of um, uh, like who should be in the canon, but I guess there's been wholesale attacks on the canon uh, itself, you know, what 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 what's being disrupted? What is it? What is the most vulnerable areas of uh, the canon? Do we think? Uh, if, I, if I could go first, I've got something here that maybe I could read. It's uh, Lucy Lippard, who's a feminist art historian from the 1970s. She says, for me, feminism is, is inseparable from socialism, although neither all Marxists nor all feminists agree on this. So basically, the feminists have a have a serious problem with the canon. It's twofold. The first is that there aren't enough women in it, which is kind of obvious. The second, and so, well, there is this idea, they mooted this idea of, oh, we need to put women into the canon. Um, but they also have a second problem with the canon, and that is that they are anti-hierarchical. They are Marxists. They don't believe there should be any hierarchy. They believe everyone should be equal. So therefore, simply replacing male heroes with female heroines doesn't cut it because then you've still got a hierarchy, you've still got an elite. So they have a problem with having a canon at all. So basically one of one of their, their attacks is that basically all canons are essentially exclusionary, which is, I think that we can agree, we can agree that the canon is exclusive rather than exclusionary. Um, so they're basically attacking the canon per se, all canons, even the um, even the canon uh, for women artists. They're attacking the idea of a, a woman artist as a genius, as a lone genius, because they talk about the 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 lie the lie of individuality and the reality of community, which is quite a chilling phrase. And it's basically their way of saying there should be no heroines, there should be no great women artists because we should be talking about communities we should be talking about collectives so i think that's something to bear in mind when uh, you hear a feminist talk about the canon is that they are not just objecting to uh, women being absent but they are objecting to the canon itself because they see canons and hierarchies as ways of men asserting um uh, the patriarchy yeah, I, I think that's a good point. That it's not. Yeah, so it's it's about subverting the canon. It's about destroying it wholesale. I, I think mm. there's some interesting thoughts on um, 
uh, like attacks from the right itself. So uh, w- one one thought I was having is around um, the, the Nietzschean Ubermensch. Uh, obviously, the, the Ubermensch he's not fet- he, he's he's like a mountaineer that isn't tied to anyone above him at all. And so mm. fundamentally, that involves not being tied down to uh, a cannon. Um, I, I don't know if um, w- 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 would anyone uh, try and de- anyone who would like to def- defend Nietzsche in terms of uh, you know fundamentally the Ubermensch is a de- deconstructivist that will destroy the canon. I don't know if there's any uh, Nietzsche fans on <laughs> pa- Panama. I would um, I would just dismiss it out of hand and say it's just a, it's not possible. There is no such thing as an artistic Ubermensch because, as I said earlier, like the, the 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 canon will always have as long as it exists, then it will have its um its chain around your ankle, if you like. I mean, I I I don't like to phrase it as if it's sort of you know painting it in a negative light. You know, I I see it as kind of a a, a good thing that you that we have a canon, but obviously a kind of if you imagine this Ubermensch kind of scaling the peak, then that's what the canon is. It's a, it's a, it's a chain around his ankle. He can't escape it. Just just as the leftists can't. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, and I think it's 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 an interesting idea. I mean, obviously there was this quite an interesting chat by AA on his last stream about the theories of history. And you could certainly, you could... I know it's not the same thing, but you could link that idea to the idea of the uh, the great man theory of history, and th- I think that this is very interesting because it it relates directly to the canon. So I mean, we've been talking mainly about the art canon. So you've got to say, well, you know, how much how much of um, how much of the art of, of a particular period or the course of history is influenced by an actual genius. By someone who is exceptional. Of course, they come from their, their tradition. They learn from a particular master. They have a certain idiom. They have, you know, they work uh, alongside colleagues and so forth. But they do things that are so original and so powerful that people want to imitate them. Uh, I don't know. Maybe this is, goes into sort of persuasion theory and so forth and emulating. Uh, you know, I mean, this is sort of something that you find in um, biology where you find a particularly where a, 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 an alpha male does something particularly well, and then you find the other alpha males and the beta males imitating this because they find it's um, been so successful. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I, I think there's some interesting thoughts around, um, again, some of those views of history and applying it to art. You know, is is there cyclical art history at the same time? Or again, like obviously... Um, well, we have, we have fallow periods. I mean, you certainly can look at certain countries or, or traditions and you look at them in a particular century and you just can't find anyone who's any good at all. There were artists there, they were doing stuff, but you know, no one's bothered to look at it or talk about it because it was rubbish, or at least yeah. mediocre. Yeah. No, it's interesting. Uh, you know, like, I, I, th- I, think the, I think the great man theory definitely fits the, with the canon best because we're, we're almost identifying those um those individual um artists but i do i do think there is some kind of cyclical thing laid on top especially around certain artistic mediums you know yeah. you, for like like tapestry tapestries for example mm-hmm. you know um beginning in the medieval period um culminating in the renaissance and then apart from arts and crafts bringing them back that was the. That's basically the end of it, you know. So, yeah, and you've also got to think that the the the, the art history that Vasari wrote was also influenced by the Great Man Theory because essentially it was telling the whole history of of, of Italian art to explain the greatness of Michelangelo. So that everything was predicated on these, you know, we had, you know, you had the, the, the triumvirate of um, Leonardo, Raphael and Michelangelo with sort of um, Donatello being a slightly earlier part of that. Um, that's the high Renaissance and you had the, you know, you had the early Renaissance and basically everything was leading towards explaining how Michelangelo could be so great and was the best artist ever. So you could say that the whole of art history in its Versarian form was 
created to explain the great man theory of the art in the uh, Western canon. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's interesting in, in the book because like um, different characters have interactions with each other as well, see, with, with each other as well, or you know, one artist follows in the wake of another uh, mm. great artist or whatever. So uh, you can definitely feel the um, the the impact that those individual artists are having. And and again, I think uh, you know when people challenge the great man theory. Um, it's, I think it's much easier to challenge it on something like a, in, on the engineering field where you can say, oh, you know, if, um, you know, whatever, um, you know, th this guy didn't invent the steam engine, someone else, some, some, someone else would. But if you didn't have Michelangelo, would you, would, you, would, would another mm. Michelangelo fill his place? I, d I don't think so. I, d I think um, you would have probably had, a le you know, someone would have been the greatest known artist at the time but definitely not as uh, good you know good as him yeah or, or or you would have had a fallow period and you would have a slump and you would just have oh okay you didn't have anything much after leonardo because there was no michelangelo oh okay so that's kind of interesting but you know you because you've always got the most the most respected and the most valuable artist of any particular period of any particular locale of any particular country but those those artists don't necessarily stand out when they're compared uh, when you look at them um, over a long period. So you know, um, and then of course you do you do get these fallow periods as well. Mm. Okay, so I think that takes us on to uh, the kind of last part that I wanted to talk about, and that is um, the, the future of the canon. So I, th I think it's fair to say that it's in. A, a bit of a tough place, definitely being like, like, like certainly at the kind of elite level that's being most affected at, at universities and the academic layer, it's certainly being challenged and subverted. Um, what do we think the future is? And um, j just in the same similar way that, um, you know, AA has been talking about um, society in general and, uh, you know, how does um you know how do we survive this this period there's a kind of couple there's, there's three major um ways that i i've kind of heard discussed and it'd be inter inter interesting to hear your thoughts on these and if, there, if there's any others but the idea of preservation so this is the the benedict uh, benedict option which is something we talked about last last time mm -hmm. so the, the the idea that we were almost kind of like hunker down in a bunker somewhere with um, you know, with a, a fantastic library of all of the great canonical works and, you know, wait for things to blow over. So preservation, parallelism, we effectively create our own um, artistic society which breaks away from, um, uh, you know, the, major, the, the main academy that is, mm -hmm. which preserves the canon uncorrupted um, or a refounding where effectively we can have it's similar to parallel uh, parallelism but it's like a total refounding of what the canon is and owning it in a, in a totally new way so um, um I, hmm. okay well i i would say i would say that parallelism is completely out for the fine art canon because what are you going to do you're going to simply walk away and say oh you can have you can have the raphaels and the rembrandts we'll just we'll just uh, start, found our own museums here and uh, do what? Because it actually involves owning physical works of art. So you can't cede those to your opponents. As it happens, th they're too valuable, they're too rare, and they are too entrenched in the ownership of the state or the state as custodian. Um, so it's very difficult for um, museums to actually sell those off, which is which is what some of them would like to do, and certainly what um, uh, what the, uh, the the left would like to do, the progressives would like to see lots of this stuff sold or never shown again, and then you could have you could impose your quotas and you could fill your empty museums full of <clears throat> you know fifty percent women, ten percent. 15% uh, ethnic minorities and whatever and whatever. Uh, but obviously, I don't think parallelism is going to work. Preservation, I think, is the most, I think that's the most viable route that I would say 
what you need to do is you need to try and keep uh, your art in places that are not infiltrated by political activists. Um, also, try to um, preserve things in hard copies. So don't depend on digital streaming for films and television. You need to get your own copies physically on Blu-ray, DVD, or, or download it or whatever. You need the physical books. Don't rely on borrowing because these things will be controlled, they will be restricted, they will be censored, and then they'll eventually be suppressed. So you need to have access to these works. Now, obviously, if you have things like books or music or film, these are reproducible copies. <clears throat> So you don't actually need an original. You don't need to preserve and protect protect an original. You can have multiple copies. So therefore, you can preserve this. And if you have the capacity to reproduce it, then it will never be destroyed if you have the will and the means to transmit it, to preserve it, and to transmit it. Uh, as for fine art, I don't know what you do if it goes into the hands of other people. Um, I don't know, maybe maybe you guys have got some thoughts on that. But So my idea is that um, parallelism doesn't work. Preservation is our best option. Refounding, I think, is not really an option because so many of uh, the core skills have been lost and we've lost a consensus about what the core skills are. So I don't think that refounding is wise at the moment. I, I guess just to kind of clarify on the parallelism, I'm not necessarily saying that uh, you know, we create our own um, different museums, but maybe um, uh, certainly kind of like in terms of te teaching the arts or te like equipping people, like ha because the canon is all about transmission, mm. um, creating new pl new places of transmission, basically. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, oh yeah, pr private art schools. Yes, definitely. So private art schools would be part of this. Private art, you know, art history courses which are not approved of by universities, not not under the control of um, academics who are uh, enthralled to the progressivist or neo-Marxist uh, outlook. Yeah. So absolutely. So you would have these centres, and you could do these in parallel. So that would work. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, Phoebus, what's your thoughts on the, the, the future of the canon and uh, continuing the transmission? Well, on refounding of uh, a tradition, I think a big question is uh, what, would, what would the mission of the art be? Because I think that's what's been lacking in recent centuries um, when it comes to the fine arts. Um, yeah, like it was a means of propaganda uh, for the church, um, the transmission of ideas or you know, educative uh, or therapeutic. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, my yeah, my question with the sort of continuing or refounding is that like what what would be the mission? I, I guess the, the, um, the maybe the mission statement would be something like to preserve the um, organic growth of a uh, of, of tr tr tradition again. Maybe focus on that kind of organic side, um, but like like I think that's a tough um, yeah a, a tough challenge. Mm. Um, what about parallelism? Do, do you think um, we can create uh, new institutions which are totally separate? Uh, and what's your thoughts on Alex's um, point around fundamentally the canon is um, it's metaphysical, but it's also physical, and a country has specific artworks that are currently contained by um, the establishment. Um, what do you do when the, the the establishment has those artworks and doesn't care about them? Yes, well, I, I, I agree that we can't completely seed the institutions, um, even if we might be failing now. But, you know, there's no hope of recreating these things. Um, uh, and I doubt we could buy them and create uh, parallel institutions. Um, 
so yeah keeping keeping you, trying to gain them back i suppose you you could you could you could start founding your own institutions and to, and obviously this is not a great subject for any of us but you know we could start collecting contemporary art you know you could become your own medici so you are immune to the diktat of the state or of um, universities or of art schools. You simply collect and patronize the art that you think is best. But obviously that limits you to art that's being made at the moment. Um, and that's not necessarily terribly exciting. Mm. Mm. Let's hope that uh, Panama's poetry book sells out and then he can uh, <laughs> s save the Western Canada no, revolution. I mean, I, I, I would say that um, uh, I, I don't want to dwell on poetry too long. I want to move back to art um, and continue what was being said just now. But um, poetry is in a bit of a rut because um, you essentially have people who are seeking, as I said, kind of transgender people moaning about how hard their kind of inner, inner emotions are in a way that doesn't appeal to anybody who, who doesn't think in that extremely... Uh, even in leftist circles, extremely fringe way of being. Um, so, but on the other hand, you have, you know, kind of, um, I, I don't want to kind of make this a personal attack on them, but people like the sort of society of classical poets that that just want to kind of almost retard uh, poetry, the kind of ro romantic era um, I ideas of what it should be. Because I think all you'll end up with is if you do, and this just applies to, uh, uh, you know, other arts as well. If if people if there's a kind of reaction and all of a sudden people only paint uh, I don't know Renaissance uh, Renaissance style artworks or they only write uh, late Victorian era style fiction and they only publish romantic style poetry all we're going to do we're, we're we're doing just as much harm by doing that as we are if we continue with the way it's currently heading you know because all that does is um, just freeze it yeah. in a very artificial way and it's not it's, it's, it's historicism way. basically yeah it's, it's essentially it's that um so in terms of how we go forward i mean i don't know how many people in the audience create art themselves but if you do i would say well you know avoid postmodernism for, for sure you know try and imbue it with some sort of meaning but um don't be afraid of being a bit pioneering or don't be afraid of modernist concept for example but don't try not to just um try not to just kind of mimic uh pre sort of uh art artwork before it was infringed with 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 modernism and leftism don't 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 fall into that trap kind of see where we can go if, if you are creating art try and break new uh lines essentially um and to, to talk about art i mean i um every sort of fortnight or so i have this kind of recurring nightmare um and it really is a nightmare where there's some sort of like young female artist um you know whose uh whose latest art installation is her like burning a rubens or a rembrandt mm. or you know uh, any all this kind of stuff or they or she she burns the kind of um illuminated manuscripts of the, the canterbury tales and things it, it, mm. it, it it's this horrifying nightmare and and it's always followed by this sequence of uh nobody does anything to stop her but this kind of all the leftist press applaud her and all the kind of weak so-called conservatives in the spectator talk about how how much of a, a sad thing it is but that's all that happens <laughs> it's just it, it's just allowed to go on and um i i, well, I think that when it when it comes to books of course you know obviously you know set aside time to read and understand these things collect as 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 uh, as alex said hard actual physical copies of these things but when it comes to art obviously i i, I seriously doubt any of us can afford you know you never know who's listening but i seriously doubt any of us can afford to spend 10 million or however much it is to buy up these artworks from from the, the, the progressives that own them and the institutions that own them mm. but i mean if it and i i think it honestly will get to the point where the, the next brave progressive virtuous thing to do is just set fire to Ruben, for example. If it gets to that point, and I, I think it will, then the only option left to us is really got hard. We, we have to somehow secure that art away from these people. We have to do some, I'm not going to specify anything, but we have to do some kind of radical thing to get 
this our traditional canon and our uh our, what essentially is our art because we, we're the ones that appreciate it and we can see the the value in it that they can't we have to save this stuff in any means we can because you know mm. if, if i this is a dark time that we are living through and you know dark, dark times are desperate times and desperate times call for desperate measures you know i think that's that's all i can really say uh further to what alex said yeah just, just from just from my perspective so i think there's a couple of interesting um things there i, th I think you know there's there's definitely two um views on art in uh, existing institutions and i think uh, alex you got you got the more kind of optimistic view that it's going to be there for a while and because it's just so wedded to the state that it's not going to go but i think i'm more on panama's side i don't know if that's a nightmare but more of a vision of the future um you know like i, I think it w the the ideologies that are being espoused in those institutions mean that at, at the very least um the, a lot of the canon will be archived and out of out of view because again i think that's mm. it's, it's not just about ownership it's about control and and um the advantage you physically need them to be seen as well as part of um, th mm. their kind of value. Do you, know, do you know what I'm saying? And that's something the, the institutions, you know, could, could could do is literally just lock it away. They're not selling them on by the letter of the law. Yeah. And, but, and, um, and, and what you'll find is in new public, what they'll do is in new publications, you'll simply get, they'll, they'll simply decide not to reproduce certain pictures that are problematic or by problematic artists or and then you know you sort of so they, they'll they'll sort of they'll control the reproductions of it but then of course you know I mean at the moment we're okay because everything is so widely spread that you can see it but obviously you can't see the you might not be able to see the original and of course I mean that's very important and and who owns the original as well that's also important yeah, like I, I think it's great. I think books are good, but there is, especially for kind of the larger formats, oil paintings, you know, like a large um, Titian of Veronese or something, mm. there is just, su there's a sublimity to seeing it that you cannot get by looking at a, you know, refer reference book. Mm. Um, so yeah, like I, like I think there there is a real challenge there. And I, I feel like, you know, t 10 years ago, what I think that, there's any chance of you know something like this happening where you know stuff's being locked away and i would have said no but i think society's moved on so quickly already that i would not be surprised if uh panama's horrific vision of the future mm. <laughs> um comes true and we've already well, he seen, may be right it, it, really, um, it, yeah. it really does haunt me you know because i it is literally roughly every two weeks i will have this this nightmare and i will just wake up feeling inexorably just gutted that just having having this vision you know, just you know Mozart uh the, the the very last copy of Bach or any or Handel just just some some like you know not nose little sort of east east or north I guess London twerk just setting these <laughs> things alight and and throwing you know Rembrandt onto the fire it's it's horrendous to <laughs> keep having these but it, it really does torture me it terrifies me that well, it, 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 it could we're at a point where tomorrow we could just wake up to that as a as, as, as a as, as an art installation in time you know well you I mean you're not entirely wrong because do you know uh who's representing britain at the venice biennale the next one i i don't care to know because it's going to be terribly upsetting isn't it? okay well i'm going to upset you it's someone called sonia boyce <laughs> who is a sonia boyce who is a, who is a feminist, and she is best no she, she is best known for taking a, a pre-Raphaelite painting off a wall uh, in a museum as a to start a conversation. Did she do anything to it? No, she didn't. She well, she wasn't allowed to, but she was allowed to deprive the people of Manchester from seeing this particular painting for however long it was, to start a conversation. And you see, what this is, is this is testing. This is testing how far they can go. Oh, because if they, can do, if they can do this, then they will be able to do it again, and they will be able to do it more, and then they'll be able to do it as a policy. They know. The, the point this is aiming towards is, as I said, it's this nightmare of all this, the traditional... They, they, they 
I, I talked earlier about how um, kind of artistic radicals see the canon as a shackle that chains them. And mm. they're well aware of the long-held opinion that you can't escape the canon. It always influences. So there are courses, I think, well, if we if the canon physically no longer exists, if it exists only as a kind of distant whiff, like sort of someone's um, odor after they've left a the room, then then we can free ourselves of it. And I mm. think that's where this is heading. And as you said, that her taking down that picture is kind of, um, you know, it's it's I suppose, uh, you know, the kind of first step towards the kind of the, the inferno. See what I mean? Mm. It, it's them piling up the kindling bit by bit. But I I do think we're at the point where they could do it and nothing would happen as i say and the, 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 the what really strikes me about this nightmare i keep having is this part always where all there's just this huge pile of uh, so-called conservative authors as i said who who write endless articles about how sad and and how we mm. the left has gone too far this time but nothing nothing gets done to stop it it's just there's just all these all these people that for the sake of their sort of you know livelihood you know, journalistic reputation. They, they they can still attend the annual party at the Spectator. You know, but, mm. but it it doesn't it doesn't matter as the as, the, as their as the canon of, of their tradition burns around. Them. <laughs> I, 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 I saw I saw a very depressing stat where uh, I think it's like sixty nine percent of millennials think that the most important thing about art is its monetary value over any kind of transcendent purpose. And I, and I do think as much as we, well, as much as I love to daily uh, malign boomers, I think that they would kick up, they're, they're the ones probably kicking up a fuss when that pre-Raphaelite went. Yes. Um, they were. Um, and also, working they, class as well. Kicking up a fuss. Yeah. They, they, didn't, they didn't make any attempt to stop it. They just kicked up a fuss. Oh, they, but they, 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 they I mean, they, they they did after the event. I mean, it did cause a bit of a furor, and I think I think maybe they had to cut it short or something because there were so many protests. But it, this it, was mainly yeah. from. But this was from traditionalists. This wasn't from uh, art curators. This was from traditionalists oh. and working class people who just loved the painting and wanted to be able to see it. So you know, but I think that tells us something about the di the distance between the elites and uh, the average person. Let's 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 hope that we can use that phrase of Orwell's that if there is hope, it lies in the proles. I mean, if if if, if as yeah. you say, there was a kind of uh, working class outrage because I mean, mm. the, the 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 sight of an angry mob of uh, essentially what are still working people mm. is quite powerful to the to the uh, the the iconoclast, um, mm. even though mm. they have their ways of avoiding it. If it's a certain if, if it goes a certain way, then they will step back because they are quite cowardly. And they're not, they, they're, they're only willing to go as far as they are because essentially the cathedral, I'm going to bring in this term now. I, mm. I, I, was, hope, I was hoping for a stream where, we, where people avoided that term, <laughs> but I, I brought it in now. But uh, the cathedral is essentially just giving them a free hand. And or, or you could just say the Conservative Party. I mean, <laughs> well, the, the Conservative Party, again, you know, part of it, they're. They're, they're doing nothing to stop it, you know. Again, yeah. as I said, it's the it's it's all those MPs that are going to write, you know, a letter to the to the Telegraph saying how 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 distasteful and how how, how much of a, a sign of the times it is that the the the, the last uh, work of, of of Rubens has been thrown on the bonfire, you know, it's terrible, terrible. Mm. Yeah. But the, it's it's sort of these 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 types of people that terrify me more so than the, than the left. Really. Mm. Um, okay, so, so just uh, we haven't got we haven't got a huge amount of time left. So I just wanted to kind of cover a few other, a few other points. Panama, I thought you had, you had a really good point around um, um, like I, I feel like there is a division uh, on the right about um, almost going like too too trad, if that makes <laughs> if that makes any sense. You know, people who are sort of stuck in the past and obsessed with historicism as a and also realism as opposed to organic growth and again we talked to, we talked about about the there is a scale between novelty and tradition and a, an organic growing canon sits somewhere in between the two at different at different points in times and i think there's definitely a large set of people that um again they don't they they see um um any form of abstractionism and they kind of immediately repulse um and also they're just kind of like Oh, why don't we just 
build buildings exactly like the, the past. There's a lot of lots of uh, you know Twitter accounts and stuff where they'll just be like, uh, or like so there's certainly certain art movements um, architecturally which aims just to sort of create exact copies of buildings of the past, which in in, in some ways is a, is a, another problem. I think so. Well, I think that um, I'm I'm going to go really to the root of what I think this is, is that there is a lack of transcendence. Um, which, and in, in the West, that means a lack of Christianity. Um, because we, without that transcendence, we are essentially just uh, cast off in this kind of rough sea where you have people saying, you know, we just need to keep putting up new start, new styles of architecture and we need to keep working on the progressive stuff. And people saying, no, no, we need to just build stuff as they would have in, you know, 1898. But the fact is that we we know how to put up factories and office parks and we can put up you know blocks of flats but we we can't build palaces for our monarchs say we can't build temples for our, for our religion and i mean th those two sort of temples and palaces those are the things that tend to survive the collapses of the civilizations and there essentially isn't really anything other than Perhaps one or two um, buildings that have been put up, kind of post enlightenment, I think that I would know. But other than that, I don't think there are really many things that are going to survive um, us as a civilization. So that's that's really what I'd say is a problem. And this just applies to all our art as well: is that there's just a lack of anything outside of our present moment. But hold on a second. I'm going to uh, I'm going to be devil's advocate this time. But uh, you know. If, if you look at the Catholic Church, or again for me, uh, Anglicanism, there is a lot of wealth. They are building there are there are buildings of churches, but they choose not to <laughs> to build good good buildings. Certainly, uh, Anglicanism has a long history of <laughs> building terrible, terrible buildings. I mean, pro Protestant. I know that Anglicanism is, is its own thing, but kind of Protestant sects in general seem to have a history of just collapsing into. Ugliness once they've departed far enough from the orthodox. That's all I'll say as a Catholic. So. Well, I, 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 I guess my, I guess my point with the with the, with the Catholic Church is that there is a, there is a lot of wealth, and um, again, Catholicism was a place where you know they, they were a major patron of the arts, and uh, you know how, how do we get the Pope on side with this? Is what I'm trying to say. Basically, how do we? Uh, <laughs> oh, get, I don't think this don't Pope. Think, yeah, the, <laughs> the, the current fellow is not exactly what you might call on site. I mean, if, if if it was up to me, if I had kind of um, any kind of say in how the Catholic Church is run, then I would advise them to just go full siege mode, full orthodoxy. Just, <laughs> just, 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 this is, we are living in the times of Caracalla. You know, this this is it. This is, we are heading towards a real collapse. So hun hunker down, go full trad, offer people a, a, a haven from the world, you know, re Re reinforce all these kind of um, not not old not tra well tra traditional yes but what it's it's not so much that they're traditional it's that they're everlasting really this this is the crux of the issue is that tra tradition en endures and its endurance is what is what gives it its strength so yeah the art I think obviously in ev in every sense but since this is really an art stream artistically the church should just be basically trying to maintain all of its historic structures and all of its historic buildings. All of all of the paintings, all the statues, all the all the great kind of kind of every piece of religious art is this great re um, kind of reformation of our of our faith, and so that's what I would advise the church to do. But obviously, they're not going to do that because <laughs> they're run by a progressive South American Marxist liberation theory. So, uh, unfortunately, it is a dark time not just for the world, but there you go. Um, okay. Okay. Cool. So um, the the only other thing I think that's that's worth bringing up is again, you know, I, I think that there the, there's something really core about this um, this idea of transmission, and, and I I almost feel like it's something personal, and you know that's that that we need to do within um, almost in a decentralized um, decentralized way, where again, you know. Um, it, it, it's like uh, you know, was it Fahrenheit three five one or whatever? You know, everyone's Four, holding five, a book. In, yeah, sorry, there you go. Everyone's holding a book in their heads, and they're kind of pa passing on that story 
uh, onto, onto other generations. And I think we need to hold the canon like a fire in our hearts that we kind of pass on to other people that we meet. So I think there's a, that kind of personal responsibility. Um, okay, cool. Well, that, that, that's kind of the uh, majority of the stream. Um, I, I was going to give you guys each a, a little chance to ha have a, a kind of a passing remark. So, um, Phoebus, I don't know if you want to say anything else or to summarize or uh, in inspire or depress us at the end of the stream. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the most important thing is um, uh, is to is to find the knowledge and cultivate it in yourself um, and just see where the flows of history take us. That's, that's very poetic, I like that. <laughs> pa Panama? Um, I will finish with an epithet by one of my favourite uh, philosophers, um, which is that uh, in democratic times, uh, no, sorry, in, in aristocratic times, um, what what has value, any value, is priceless. In democratic times, what is priceless has no value. Okay. Very nice. And uh, Alexander? Uh, I would say um, if you believe in tradition and you want to see the best of what we've done passed on to future generations, you have to defend it and you have to be assertive and you have to be not afraid to speak out and commit publicly. So uh, I would say follow that course. Okay, br brilliant. Uh, and we'll just close off with a, with a last round of, uh, of shilling. Uh, Alex, you've obviously got your new book out. Uh, please follow him on Twitter as well. Any, anything else you want to plug? Yeah, um, I don't do much on Twitter, but you can but you can find out what I'm doing on uh, Alex. Uh, what is this? I can't even remember. Uh, Adam's artist. You can also follow my uh, articles. You've got some original articles and links to other articles on the website www.alexanderadamsart dot wordpress dot com and the current book is iconoclasm identity politics and the erasure of history the book the um the the article we discussed earlier relating to the canon can be found online but it is there is an expanded version which is in the book culture war art identity politics and cultural entryism which is also available wonderful um, guys, you've got, have you got anything else to, to, to shill at all or upcoming stuff that you want to talk about? Uh, well, if anyone uh, wants any typesetting or videography work done, um, you can find us on Discord, Phoebus1262. Um, yeah, nothing else. Great. And pa Panama? When's, when's that? Uh, you've got to send some poetry now to me I, after, after the book. I'm very excited about this. I will send you some poetry but obviously I have to be careful because uh, I don't want dots yet so, uh, <laughs> but uh, I would just just one last word is that uh, you know pe people out there Im immerse yourselves in in the canon immerse yourselves in art S set aside time to study and read particularly the ancient um, classics or anything else because you know that's really where our canon begins is, is in the ancient world so um you know just just spend time on this you know don't don't be one of those people that talks about you know much Matrad, you know all the all all of the great things without actually knowing anything about it. Mm. Yeah, no, 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 no laughing. No laughing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Wonderful, guys. Thank you very much, and um, hopefully we'll do something again a little bit sooner next time. All right. Catch you later. Fairly well. <laughs>